please remain standing for the invocation. Lord of Re Resurrection Surprises, open our hearts this day to the presence of Jesus Christ. Erase our excuses and doubts for unbelief and exchange them for a strong witness to the power of your mercy and love. Come to us with your healing today, even as we come to you in worship and prayer, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. please. Our New Testament text today comes from the Gospel of John chapter 21 verses 1 through 19. I'll go to verse 19, page 902 in the Pew Bible. John 21, 1 through 19. Afterward Jesus appeared again to a disciple by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Galilee and Canaan, the son of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was him. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garments around him and jumped into the water. The other disciple followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask them, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared to them since he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. 
Again, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he asked him a third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then he said, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you would stretch out your hands and someone else would dress you and lead you where you do not wish to go. And Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death he would glorify the Lord. And then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this word and pray that your word would touch our hearts in this time together. Amen. This past week at Yankee Stadium, an unusual event took place. Aaron Judge of the Yankees, who's at bat, there's a run on base. There were two strikes on Aaron Judge, the pitcher threw the ball, and the umpire rang up his right hand, strike three, you're out. And Judge started to take a couple of steps towards the dugout, but then time was called for the pitcher had balked. He had not come to a complete stop before he threw his pitch, and therefore a balk was called. The runner in base got to advance one base, and more important for Aaron Judge, that pitch didn't count. He had another opportunity. So now he steps into the batter's box, and would you believe it, he hit a home run. From going striking out to hitting a home run, well, Peter has struck out. He had denied his Lord three times. And Peter, he wasn't walking back to the dugout, but he was walking back to his life as a fisherman. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, he was returning to his life as a fisherman. He had been with Jesus for three years, but now he denied him three times. And he doubted the Lord's ability to forgive him. Therefore, he thought it was all finished. And perhaps you struggle with that from time to time. Perhaps you feel there are things for which God, through Christ, cannot forgive you. If so, listen to today's text because we see clearly where Christ forgave Peter and he forgives us. Peter doubted that the Lord could forgive him. And this was surprising, shocking for a couple of reasons. One, it was Jesus who said, or Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? And Jesus said, and Peter said, seven times. And Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And then we are told twice, both by Luke and by Paul, that Jesus appeared to Peter twice on Easter day. Surely there must have been words of healing and forgiveness. But Peter, he did not believe the Lord could forgive him. If you doubt that too, listen to today's message, for I think there's three reasons why Peter struggled with that. One, Peter lived in an unforgiven culture. When Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? He was being generous. For the rabbis taught you forgave three times, and Peter took that number and he doubled it. But Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Obviously, he didn't mean 490. We forgive continually again and again. Because we're keeping score. Are we truly, really forgiven? Peter lived in an unforgiven culture, so do we. Over the years, in recent years, I read about famous people. It might be actors, actresses, singers, ball players, who through social media, people discover something they wrote, they said, or they did when they were teenagers. And it makes no difference if it was 20, 10, 30, 40 years ago, they're crucified for it. They need to make amends. How would you like to be classified, defined by something you did, said, or wrote as a teenager? We live in an unforgiven culture. But praise God, if we belong to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, we are citizens of a culture where grace abounds. Grace is not only absent, but grace abounds. And we praise God for that. As I said, we live in a culture that is an unforgiven culture. And over the years, my adult years, I played a lot of softball, played a lot of basketball, and time and time again from my teammates, I experienced an unforgiven nature. Teammates who took all the joy out of playing the game. You made an error, they were on your case, saying words I wouldn't dare repeat here in front of you today. If you made a dumb play in the basketball court, the same thing. And perhaps that's why I remember an act of forgiveness that took place 35 years or so ago on a basketball court. When I first went into ministry, one of the neighboring pastors had a basketball team. He asked me if I wanted to play in his team, and I said, sure. And after a few practices, he said to me, Jim, I want you to use your height to play defense and to rebound. Of course, what he also was saying was this, don't shoot the ball. <laughs> that was the message to well. You rebound, you play defense, don't shoot the ball. 
Well, a few years later, we moved her in Connecticut. I'm serving the church in Connecticut. I found another team to play with. And in a game one day, I put on the clinic. They showed why that coach and pastor in New Hampshire told me not to shoot the ball. <laughs> the basket net is right there. I'm under the opposing net. I got the ball in my hand. There's a man there supposedly guarding me. He's just standing there watching me about 10 feet from me. I throw the ball up and I miss. It comes right back to me. I throw it up again. Instant replay. Back of my hand, no basket. I throw it up a third time. Now I'm 0 for 3. I played a lot of salt, but I'm thinking three strikes and I'm out. So I turn around hoping that one of the players on my team who's met the other end of the court is now coming up the court. I can throw him the ball. And there was one man running up the court, so I threw him the ball. And before I could take a step or two away from the basket, he shocked me. He threw the ball right back to me. And I'm thinking, haven't you just seen me miss three shots? <laughs> but as I thought about that over the years, he's saying, I believe in you. Don't give up. I forgive you. And you may think that's strange, but believe me, if you played with some of the teammates I played with, you would understand what he was saying, I forgive you for missing those three shots. And by the grace of God, I made the fourth shot. <laughs> I shared that story many times, but just recently writing this sermon, this thought came to my mind too. I wonder what the other three members of my team were thinking when this player threw the ball back to me. Because the guy who threw that ball back to me, I remember his name, his name was Danny. And he could make a basket from 20 to 30 feet from the basket. Here I was right under. I missed three in a row. And my teammates were probably thinking, what is he doing? Why is he giving the ball to Jim? I thought of that in light of today's lesson. Jesus forgave Peter in front of his disciples, in front of the very men who knew that Peter had denied the Lord three times. He wanted them to know of his forgiveness for Peter, but also equally important, I think, he wanted those men to know this. They were going out soon to build the church of Christ, to begin his church. And I think Jesus wanted those disciples to know in the church, people are going to mess up. They're going to fail from time to time. Forgive them. Give them that second, that third, that fourth chance, no matter how many chances might be necessary. But on that basketball court that day, after I missed that third shot, I was ready to give up on myself. And that's the second reason I think Peter didn't accept the Lord's forgiveness. Peter was ready to give up on himself. But praise God, Jesus Christ had not given up on Peter. Peter denied the Lord, as we know, three times. He figured, well, I'm finished. My life as a disciple is worthless. I can't follow him. I'll go back to knowing what I know how to do. I'll be a fisherman. But praise God, as we read the scripture lesson in the morning, Jesus Christ was there. And he was reaching out to Peter. Jesus was not about to give up on Peter or any one of us. And as I looked at that recently, what I saw here and what I realized is this. Jesus was acting out one of the parables he told. Remember the parable he told of the lost sheep? where a shepherd had 100 sheep and 99 were in the fold, but one wandered off and the shepherd went out searching for that one sheep that was lost until he found it. That's exactly what Jesus was doing here. He's going out to Peter because Peter's leaving the fold. He's going back to being a fisherman. And there's danger that Peter might take some of those other disciples with him who also were fishermen because they all, except for John and even John, they had let their Lord down the night that he was arrested, the night of his betrayal. But there was Christ. There was Christ reaching out to him. And if you look at today's text, and if you're familiar with the call of Peter, the first call of Peter in Luke chapter 5, you see the parallels. Way back in Luke chapter 5, three years earlier, when Jesus called Peter, a very similar thing took place. Jesus arrived on the beach one morning. There's a large crowd. Simon Peter's boat is there. He's been fishing all night with his partners. And Jesus gets him into Peter's boat uses his boat for a pulpit, and that boat is pushed off from the shore. And then when Jesus was done preaching, he says to Peter, put out your nets, boat, for a catch. And Peter said, Lord, we toil all night, haven't caught anything. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And of course, when he did those nets, they were overflown with fish too. And then when they came to shore, Jesus said, follow me. Jesus is on the beach, and he's repeating the scene of that original call three years earlier. What we see with the Lord's forgiveness is beyond the forgiveness or included with the forgiveness, there's restoration, there's renewal, there's healing. Jesus hadn't given up on the Apostle Peter. And not only did he just forgive him, but he restored him. 
He gave him back his position of authority. Three times he raised a question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And after each affirmation of love, he gave him a task to do, tend my lambs. Take care of my sheep, tend, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter said, work for you to do. I forgive you. You're our apostle of mine. I called you to be a disciple. Now go out and get to work. And there's the good news for us. The apostle Paul, writing to young Timothy, wrote these words. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Think about that. Peter denied the Lord, but Jesus wasn't about to deny Peter. Peter thought he was finished as a disciple, but Jesus wasn't about to let him walk away from that calling. And of course, that first time when he asked Peter if he loved him, there's that phrase, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Scholars, biblical scholars and students of the Bible have wondered what was Jesus referring to when he referred to more than these? And there are two real strong possibilities. One, Jesus may have pointed to those disciples who were with Peter. Because all told, there's seven disciples there. Seven of the remaining 11 are present. There's six disciples with Peter. If Jesus could have pointed to the other men and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Because in the upper room, Peter said, Lord, they might desert you. But I love you more than they do, and I'm willing to die with you tonight. And of course, we know how that worked itself out. The other option is this, and this is one I believe. I think Jesus pointed to a net that was full of fish. And I think Jesus was asking Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than the life of a fisherman? Do you love me more than these? Because make no mistake about it, Peter was on the verge of going back to his old way of life because he doubted that the Lord could and would forgive him. So there on the beach, Jesus is presenting Peter with an option. He's presenting him with a choice. Peter, do you love me more than these? And we're in John's Gospel. And I think that's significant because so many times in John's Gospel, when Jesus told a parable or when Jesus spoke, Jesus always, of course, would talk about something physical, but he's really talking about something spiritual. And right here, I'm looking at a couple of objects on the beach there, and they're physical objects, but they have great spiritual implications. Peter is standing by a charcoal fire, and there's a net full of fish lying there on the sand. And both of those are important. Why is the charcoal fire important? Because it was around the charcoal fire that Peter denied knowing the Lord three times. And now, of course, there's that net full of fish. And what Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. Do you love me? Do you love me more than the life of a fisherman? And, of course, Peter said, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. Peter chose the life of being an apostle. Peter let go of his doubts and he chose Jesus over his doubts. He chose Jesus over his failures. Or to use a term I heard a pastor say recently, Peter chose Jesus over his history. And we all have a past history, do we not? A past history that we would like to forget. A past history at times that can paralyze us, that can leave us in unhealthy ways emotionally, spiritually. We need to let go of the past and to accept the healing, to accept the healing that comes from Christ because when Jesus forgave Peter that day so long on the beach, there was healing as well as restoration, as well as a calling. So I see two, two possibilities why Peter may have doubted the Lord's ability to forgive him. One, the unforgiven culture in which he lived. And we live in a culture like that too. And secondly, Peter was ready to give up on himself. And haven't we been there times in our lives where we try something, we fail, we try again, and we fail, and we're ready to give up. But praise God that he doesn't give up on us. And then there's a third reason. And this is a very real reason for Peter and for many people I've talked to over the years. Pride. Pride. Pride which says my sin is too great for the Lord to forgive. I can't tell you how many times in ministry I have talked to people who believe that a certain sin that they committed was too great of a sin for Jesus Christ to forgive them on the cross. Peter had that pride. I think Peter would believe my sin is too great. And we know the pride that was in Peter. Think back to the upper room. Think back to that night of the Last Supper when Jesus comes around washing his disciples' feet. 
He comes to Peter after he'd washed some of the other's feet, and Peter says, no, Lord, you're not worthy to wash my feet. None of the other disciples apparently said that. That's the pride of Peter. And then, of course, Peter's pride when he boasted and said that he was willing to die for the Lord that night. Pride. Do not believe that lie. Do not believe that there is a sin that Christ died for on the cross which he will not forgive you. That is not only a lie of Satan, it is a heresy. On the cross, Jesus paid it all. We sing the hymn so many times, particularly during Holy Week, Jesus paid it all. The hymn we're going to close with, it is well with my soul, my sin not in part but in the whole. It's nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Do not believe the lie that there's a certain sin that Jesus Christ will not forgive you. Because if you believe that lie, it leads into a heresy. If you believe that lie, what you're really saying is, he died on the cross, but he needs my help. There's something I have to do. And that leads to our works of righteousness. And we are not saved by our works. The Bible makes that clear. The New Testament makes that clear. Even Paul, looking back to Abraham, says Abraham was saved by faith. We are saved by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. It's not by works. The Bible tells us all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are not saved by our works but by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross alone. When he died, he said, it is finished. It is finished, and what he was referring to was God's plan of salvation. It's finished. It's complete. There's nothing else to be done that can be done that must be done. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 10, he writes these words, We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Again, right here in John's Gospel, if you think that you must earn your salvation, there's something that you must do Look at the scripture lesson before us today because again I see two objects that speak to this great spiritual truth. The disciples, they fish all night, their nets, they're empty. There's not one fish in their nets. That's the effect if we think we can earn our way to heaven, if we can work our way for salvation, our efforts are empty. But when we trust Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, what he accomplished on the cross for us, then our lives reflect the net that is full of 153 fish that is overflowing. Do not believe the lie that there's a sin in your life that is too great for the Lord to forgive. On the cross, he said, it is finished. On the cross, he paid it all. And we look to the cross, and we see his forgiveness. We remember the penitent thief on that cross, as you know, two thieves were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. And I have read where a crucifixion is probably the most painful, evil way that humankind has ever invented to torture someone unto death. And I mention that because on the cross, Luke tells us of the thief who we know as the penitent thief. And the other thief was mocking Jesus. He was saying, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and save us. And the other thief said, do you not fear God? We are receiving the just penalty for our payment, for our sins. He was a robber. He was a murderer. Think about that. He's hanging on the cross in pain that we cannot even imagine, in a physical torturous pain that we cannot even imagine. And he's saying, I am deserving. We're getting what we deserve. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingly power. And of course, Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. And also on the cross, don't forget these words of Jesus. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive those who drove the crown of thorns into my head. Father, forgive those who drove the nails through my body. Father, forgive those who are mocking me and taking great delight in my pain and in my suffering. And then as we read through the New Testament, as we read through the Bible, we find the Lord's forgiveness for a man who we would call a terrorist today. A man whose sole purpose in life was to put in prison and put to death anyone, everyone who called on the name of Jesus Christ. Today we would call him a terrorist. He was opposed, violently opposed to the church of Jesus Christ in the first century. And these are his own words. This is his own testimony. He wrote these words, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, I even followed them to foreign cities. 
At another time, he said these words about himself. You have heard in my previous life how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. And then we have this description of him. By one of the early Christians in the first century, this man wrote, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And now he's come here to arrest all who call on your name. But God forgave this man. The grace of Jesus Christ was even extended to this man, the leading terrorist of the early church. And this man went on to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote many things, including these words when he wrote, Listen, I tell you all the mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is the victory? Where, O oh, death, is the sting? Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, obviously the Apostle Paul. Are your sins greater than those of the Apostle Paul? who Christ reached out to outside the city gates of Damascus and changed that man from being a prosecutor of a church to being a leading apostle to the Gentiles. Do not doubt the Lord's ability to forgive no matter what sin you might be holding on to. And of course, the apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans chapter 8 wrote these words, there is no condemnation. No condemnation in those who are in Jesus Christ. On the cross, he paid it off. He covered it all. It is finished. I come back to today's beginning of today's text. And in the very beginning, as you know, the disciples, they fished all night, came up empty. And Jesus stood on the shore. And he cried out to them and said, Friends, have you any fish? Friends, have you any fish? Do not skip over that word, friends. Because in the upper room, Jesus told the disciples, no longer do I call you my servants, but now one I call your friends. For a servant does not know his master's business, but everything the Father has told me, I have told you. He called them friends in the upper room. That was before Peter denied him three times. That was before he asked Peter, James, and John to pray with him for an hour in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was before all his disciples, save John, deserted him when he was taken away in the garden and led to the cross. And now, after that fact, he's still calling them friends. He still calls them friends. Oh, the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, where he reaches out with his healing and with his restoration. As we read the Gospels, so many times when Jesus healed someone, he would include these words, go and sin no more, or your sins are forgiven. And that phrase, your sins are forgiven, really angered the religious leaders of the day because they raised the question, well, who can forgive sins but God alone? Exactly. He is not only fully human, he's God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And as Paul writes, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting the trespasses against them. On the cross, he paid it all. And that day on the beach to Peter, he was saying to Peter in so many words after he forgave him, after he gave him the three assignments, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, he was saying, Peter, don't return to your old way of life. Come, follow me. And Peter, of course, chose to follow him. And as we might say to rest, as we know his history. But as we look at today's passage, there is an irony here. At the beginning of chapter 21, the Gospel of John Peter is returning to his old way of life. He's turning his back on the call to follow Jesus and he's returning to his old way of life of being a fisherman. But then the chapter ends when Peter is turning his back on the old way of life, leaving that behind him to answer the call to follow Jesus Christ and to walk in the pathway that Christ has assigned for him. A pathway of forgiveness, a pathway of healing, a pathway of restoration, a pathway. That was the path that Peter chose. May we walk that same path as well. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful assurance 
that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus covered it all. There's not one sin, not one failure, not one act of disobedience that has not, is not covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And therefore, Lord, let us not listen to the lies of the enemy who would have us believe that because of a certain act or deed that Christ no longer has a plan for our lives. We look at today's scripture lesson, we know how false that accusation is. For Peter denied him. Peter thought he was finished. And Jesus said, Peter, follow me. Peter, I love you. Peter, you are forgiven. Peter's a kingdom work for you to do. And Peter left those nets and followed him. And so may we. Whatever we have been hanging on to that might hinder us in our walk with him. May we just leave it lying there. And may we follow him. Amen. Our close to him, it is well with my soul. And it's number 428. Number 428. Let's all stand.
and let us pray. And now may the love of God, the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, His Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.